Thank you all for attending What Matters to Me and Why today. Uh, how are you all feeling about the election yesterday? You good, pretty good? Yeah, it was a fairly historic night. And if you're a liberal progressive in this country, I think it was a really important night. Uh, we elected our first openly gay senator. Two states uh, supported, endorsed uh, same-sex marriage provisions. Two states uh, fully legalized marijuana. That's never happened anywhere in the world. And um, unfortunately, we didn't pass 34, which was death penalty abolishing death penalty in California. You know, the issue of state and violence, which is in the heart of the death penalty, is really a complicated issue. And we've seen the dark side of that throughout the 20th century, especially through ethnic cleansing and genocide. So we're really fortunate to hear from Stephen Smith today, who thinks about this, who's studied it, who's uh, reflected upon these very uh, uh, deeply um, profound and um, um, uh, imminent issues, uh, more than probably most people. So I'm really grateful that he found time in his busy schedule to be with us today, and there's something especially poignant about hearing him speak uh, the day after an election. So um, as you all know, one of the things that makes our series so wonderful is that it's student-run. All the events are student-produced. The speakers are chosen by students and introduced by students. And so today it gives me great pleasure to introduce the student who will introduce Stephen Smith. Today um, we have senior Alex Fullman, uh, who will introduce Stephen Smith. Uh, Alex is a senior at USC. And I know he's not going to like this, but I'm going to say this. When I first met him as a freshman, he said, one day I'm either going to be a Supreme Court justice or a university president. And, um, and I said to him, you know, I think you can be both, and I still do. So uh, it, Alex started uh, Jewish World Watch right here at USC. It's an organization that is um, deeply concerned um, with genocide and does a lot of work around genocide prevention and education. Um, so please join me in welcoming to What Matters to Me and Why, Alex Fullman. Uh, I'm sure many of you know that the Shoah Foundation was founded here in 1994 by Steven Spielberg and today contains 52,000 video testimonies of Holocaust survivors. And uh, Dr. Smith was appointed to lead the Shoah Foundation in 2009. And it's really not an exaggeration in any way to say that Dr. Smith is the world's leading advocate of Holocaust uh, education and, and, and genocide prevention. He's an extraordinary human being. Who, uh, originally, who previously was the founding director of the UK Holocaust Center, which was Britain's first Holocaust Memorial and Educational Institute. And he also founded the Aegis Trust, which is an agency that works globally to prevent genocide and crimes against humanity. Um, uh, I could go on and on about his accomplishments. His resume is pages and pages long. But uh, I recently heard him tell an, an incredible story, and I won't do it justice, but I'll try to, to sort of relay it to you. Uh, in Israel, there's a group of about 26,000 people uh, that have been designated righteous among the nations. And these are all people who saved at least one Jewish life during the Holocaust, except for one of them. There is one man named Armin T. Wegner who did not save any Jewish lives directly during the Holocaust, but is still one of the righteous among the nations. And here's his story. In 1915, he was a young German who had been sent to Syria, to, and he was part of uh, the German Red Cross, as it was. And he'd spend his weekends going and documenting and taking pictures of the Armenian genocide. And he was caught, and he was sent back to, go, he was sent back to Germany for court-martial. But he took these photos, and he took his evidence with him. And in the 1920s, these photographs became key pieces of evidence in an attempt to bring justice to the Armenians. And then again in 1923, Armin T. Wegner was a young novelist who became concerned with what was happening in the Soviet Union. And he took the train throughout the Soviet Union and started documenting what he saw. And he wrote a novel called Five Fingers Over You, which predicted the horrors of the Stalinist era. And then finally in 1933, when there was the first anti-Jewish boycott in Germany, Armin Wegner, who was then a, a journalist, wrote a five-page letter to Hitler. And in his own name and in his own voice, he, he said, what you did to the Jews today, you did to me as a German. And he said that what you, what you are doing will bring shame on, on our nation and lead to the destruction of the Jews. I think he spent time in seven uh, concentration camps just for writing that letter. But he was the only known man 
who said in his own voice, stop what you're doing, this is wrong. And I think that what makes Dr. Smith such a remarkable human being is that it, he is in his own way an Armin T. Wegner who really works every single day to advance justice, to tell the story, to spread the word about, about uh, genocides and mass atrocities, and to try to make sure that they never ever happen again. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Smith. Hello and good afternoon. Um, I was born in Sherwood Forest. Well, not actually in the forest, but in the region of the UK, which is currently designated as Sherwood Forest. Now, I just need to reset your imagination, because when I say Sherwood Forest, what comes to mind? Robin Hood. Robin Hood, yeah. Oak trees, deer bounding through the countryside, men in green tights. What I want you to imagine or reimagine are uh, coal mines. Lots of coal mines, because Sherwood Forest has a very large coal field under it, to the extent that there is no forest. So I grew up in Sherwood Forest, and the view out of my bedroom window was of a very large black slag heap. And the dust that used to land on my windowsill used to get wiped off every week because the white windows would turn gray and then ultimately black within about two weeks. In fact, I was uh, growing up in a uh, working class, white, entirely white community, um, to the extent that um, there were uh, the ethnic minorities in our town uh, result, resulted in about 10 people in total, two families. The Charles family, who were from Jamaica, and the Taylor family, who were gypsies. And so... I was introduced to racism very early in my life because I saw what happened to Tim Charles in my class. And I saw what happened to Rob Taylor in my class. It made me angry. It made me uncertain. It made me unsure. But I knew that what I was seeing was extremely dangerous. But I had no idea how to make sense of it. When I was 13 years old, my uh, parents uh, decided we'd go on a family holiday to, um, to Israel to go and see the Holy Land. We were a Christian family. My father was the Methodist minister in the mining village, and my mother was the religious education teacher. Um, we actually lived in a village which had the highest crime rate outside of London in the country. And because my parents were involved in the, um, the, the social and community side of our, uh, our village, um, I spent a lot of time um, getting very close to what it meant to have violent crime in a society, what it meant to have um, about 30% of all school children over the age of 13 with a criminal record, um, and about half of my class having served time by the age of 16. We went on this family holiday to Israel because my parents, who were religious and wanted to try and explore something of their own uh, religious roots, decided to go and see the Holy Land. So we went, and we went and toured the sights and sounds of the origins of Christianity, which actually, for me as a 13-year-old, was fascinating. But something began to dawn on me as we went around there. There seemed to be a, a link between what I thought was the Old Testament and the people that seemed to be alive and well in Israel um, Jewish people, and the Jewish religion and tradition. And one day, we went to the Western Wall. We call it the Kotel. And it was a Friday afternoon. I, 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 we kind of knew that the Sabbath in the Jewish religion was on a Saturday. We didn't really know it began the night before. And actually, if you go the afternoon before the night before, there's all of this activity going on as people prepare for the Sabbath. And there we were. And I stood there and realized I was seeing something that was awesome, not in the American sense of, you know, awesome, but really awe-inspiring. Standing in front of this uh, wall that had been there for thousands of years and not quite knowing what to make of it, knowing that there was some connection to me, but I didn't know quite what. I did know that the founder of Christianity was Jewish and had gone to that place when it was the temple and had been there because my Bible stories told me that, but I couldn't quite understand what these people were doing there um, 
at a site of the Jewish religion that had been there for thousands of years. Thus began a journey. A journey of discovery in which I became very interested in the relationship between Judaism and Christianity in particular because it seemed to have some relationship to my tradition, but I was trying to figure out what. I remember I came back to my uh, little library in our, in our mining village of Ollerton, and I went to the librarian and I said, um, do you have any uh, books about Judaism? She said, no, I don't think so. But I'll go and look. So she went and she came back. A couple of minutes later, she had two books. One was Martin Gilbert's Atlas of the Holocaust. Not exactly an introduction to Judaism, but nevertheless, she sort of saw a correlation between my request and the book. And the other one was a novel by a guy called Chaim Potok called The Chosen. The Holocaust book looked a bit heavy to me, so I left that and took The Chosen. And in that book, there's a... a, a, a unraveling of this relationship between these two boys, one of, you know, um, assimilated and secular and the other one deeply religious within um, uh, the uh, community, Jewish community in New York. And by the time I'd finished reading The Chosen and then The Promise and My Name's Asher Lev, a trilogy of um, Chaim Potok, by which actually I'd put down the trilogy of um, Tolkien that I was working on at that particular moment in time. They sat on the bed with then Chaim Potok sitting on top of them. And then when I finished Potok, I went back to Tolkien. But in the process, without doubt, I can say for certain in my mining village, I was the most informed child in my school about the dilemmas of Jewish identity in the Lower East Side of New York, probably in my county, actually. As I explored that, I began to sense something that really troubled me. And that was whenever I came across Content related to the Jewish community in the Jewish world, there seemed to tag along with it something that we call anti-Semitism. And that Jews, in describing their cultural, religious, personal identities um, in, in literature such as I was reading as my first introduction, and then later as I began to explore um, the tradition of Judaism and the history of Judaism more fully, um, it was always there. 1991, I was um, graduating, uh, having majored in theology. I majored in Christian theology, minored in Judaism. Well, that's the equivalent, and if we were to apply that to the U.S. university system. And the more I unfolded Judaism and Christianity, the more I realized that anti-Semitism was an integral part of the Christian world. And that didn't square with my own experience because my parents and those around me never expressed that, certainly never explicitly. Um, and yet, the evidence was too damning and too consistent for me to ignore them. And so I decided I was going to write a PhD in some aspect of anti-Semitism. So I went back to, uh, to talk to a, a, a local community of mine where there was a small Jewish community in the middle of, uh, Midlands of England, in Leeds. Um, and I told them I'd like to, to, to write the history of their community, um, but in particular to explore how a small provincial Jewish community had lived um, in an environment which was very often hostile and what the experiences were of that. I went back to Israel to go and speak to the people at the Hebrew University um, that were running a center on anti-Semitism there, and while I was there, I went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. Now, you see, I had this impression. I was, I was a, a post-war baby boomer kid that actually grew up in an environment in Britain where, you know, um, well, I guess, you know, the whole narrative was we, we you know, dig for big victory, battle of Britain, we defeated the Nazis, you know, we, um, we um, liberated the, the concentration camps, and, you know, we're all right, Jack. And then the more... I thought about it, the more I realized that what had happened in Europe um, was not all right, Jack, and certainly not for the British either, who sort of stood there and said, it wasn't us. We liberated Europe from whatever happened. And so I went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, that day, um, thinking in some way or other that the Holocaust was pre predominantly, if not in entirely, a Jewish issue. That is, um, the books I'd read, the films I'd seen, the, 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 the things that existed around me in popular culture that told me about the Holocaust were predominantly written by, presented by, represented by people who were Jewish, including those who survived the Holocaust. 
it was a kind of a sacred space in a way in which I saw myself as an outsider looking in and, and f yeah, I guess to some degree um, feeling the weight of the tragedy but not seeing my relationship to it. Probably why I didn't take Martin Gilbert's Atlas of the Holocaust that day. So I went into Yad Vashem thinking that the Holocaust was a Jewish issue and then as I walked around I became, um, well emotionally was very um, struck by and overwhelmed by what I saw in the museum there. But two things came out of it. The first thing was I realized that day that whatever created the conditions in which the mass murder of European Jewry took place were not the making of the Jews of Europe. They were its victims. Whatever it was that created the possibility of that came out of what we call West European civilization or Western civilization. It was possible because it was inherent within the DNA of the civilization of which I am a part. So my question was, um, how is it that no one's talking about this? Well, why is it that the victims are left to carry the burden of this experience and to, to have to represent it and to create museums and memorials and places to tell that story, and yet those who are responsible for it and for the civilization that's responsible for it, uh, we seem to have a pall of silence sitting around this. I was there with my brother who was a medical student and we sat on this bench um, in what they call the Avenue of the Righteous, which is exactly where um, the tree to Armin T. Wegner, who we heard a little bit about a moment ago, is planted. And what was going through my mind was, um, so where do we sit in relationship to this? How come I've just spent four years studying Christian theology and nobody ever mentioned the Holocaust once? And the people in my year group, unlike, unlike me, many of them were intending to go into the clergy following their academic degree and will be in pulpits with congregations in communities where there is racism and violence and anti-Semitism. Are they equipped to deal with that, I wondered? And how come, if the Holocaust happened within the Christian world, how come that people who are practicing Christianity are not talking about this because it seems to present the single biggest challenge to Christendom? Both the Protestant and Catholic churches became a part of the environment in which the Holocaust took place. They became part of one of the organs of state, of the Nazi state. My brother, a medical student, um, asked the question, so how come I just spent 13 weeks for a full semester doing medical ethics and nobody talked about the Nazi doctors? How can you talk about medical ethics without raising the issue of the fact that medical professions who trained and took the Hippocratic Oath um, ultimately ended up carrying out a sterilization program and a euthanasia program and stood at the end of the ramp where the trains came in at Auschwitz and decided who would live and who would die with a wag of their finger? Thus began a journey uh, which, uh, or the second leg of a journey, which resulted in uh, my brother and I creating Britain's first Holocaust Center, uh, which opened in 1995. So why does that matter to me? Well, and why does it bring me here? Well, you see, during the creation of the Holocaust Center, during which I, at time I gave a considerable amount of time and effort and resources to ensuring that the Holocaust was known about in British society, not from the perspective of the Jewish community, but from the general society to say, this really matters to us. You see, what I understood was that there were places that you could visit. You, could go, you can go today and visit the museum at Auschwitz-Birkenau, or you can go to um, the former camp at Mauthausen in Austria, or you can go to the memorial site at Bergen-Belsen, and you can see the places where these atrocities took place. But what really occurred to me at that day at Yad Vashem was, wait a minute, the Nazis created those places. We need to preserve them because they have to be there for the historical record. But where is the place where we say as a civilization, we understand that this emerged out of our civilization, that genocide is possible here too, and that we are thinking about those issues. We will remember the past, but we will do so clearly as a warning for our future, and we will think about the values of our society and how we relate to one another and how our communities interact, and we will be very clear with the next generation through our education programs that this is not acceptable. And to think about the values that we want to have within our world. And we realized that those places did not exist in Europe. And so we created one. During the creation of the Holocaust Center in the United Kingdom, 
Uh, I was going back and forward, you know, it was a big project, and I'd never done a big project before. I was 24, and I was trying to raise the money and find a site and build a building and build a museum. And if you've not done that before, it's tricky the first time, and you're trying to work everything out. And, you know, I was getting home late in the evening, and something was going on in Rwanda, and I go back, and something is going on in Bosnia, and I go, well, why can't they explain this stuff more clearly? And I go back the next day on the building site and pour some concrete, and I come back the next day, and there's bodies floating down the the river in Rwanda. Where is Rwanda anyway? And I would go back the next day and I'd be talking to the carpenters about the roof that we're going to put on. And I'd go back and I'm thinking, my gosh, that doesn't look like a tribal conflict. That looks like genocide. And then it was all over. And I'd done nothing. Absolutely nothing. Except talk to the guys pouring the concrete and the architect. And I was creating a memorial as a warning to the future. And the future was now and I was absent, totally absent. Anyway, you, you know, you kind of live through that and you get used to the fact that you've failed and you keep plodding on. You think that, you know, you've got to keep going at this because there is something really important to say here. And then finally you've got the invitations out to open your center and you're really pleased because people are now recognizing it's going to actually happen and then you sit down and you watch the news and there's some story about seven and a half thousand Muslim men and boys being shot into mass graves in Srebrenica. The next day I uh, sat down on our concrete floor with the carpet layers about to come in to lay the carpet in the Holocaust Center. I said we have to stop this project right now. Because if you think about it, if it was 7,500 yesterday, what if it's 2,000 a day, 1,000 tomorrow, 5,000 the day after, 10,000 the day after that, 500 the day after that? What might the number be six weeks from now when we open this center? And which one of us wants to stand up and say to the world's media, we're really delighted to open this memorial to the Holocaust. And when they say to us, and so what have you done about the genocide in Bosnia over the last six weeks? We say nothing. So I was all ready to get on a plane and go to Bosnia. I contacted the Royal Air Force and got myself a flight. I contacted the BBC and got myself a pass. I spoke to the Secretary General's office at the UN and got permission to go into Bosnia. And I was about to go. And my brother said to me, you know what? I think that's a really bad idea. Because right now in Bosnia, what they need is NATO and how. And last time I looked, you weren't NATO. You're a civilian. You go out there. I said, well, you know, what about Armin Wagner? My hero, actually, Armin Wagner. Well, yeah, but you go out there, you take a bullet to the chest, you come back in the body bag. We all say, what a great guy. He died in Bosnia trying to save the world from genocide. But actually, he really should have been doing it 10 years previously, but he didn't get to it. But we'll have a nice funeral. We'll put some flowers down, and that'll be good. And then what? How about we commit to getting the Holocaust Center open, but we also make a commitment to ensure that every single person that comes through this, these doors knows this is not a memorial to the past, it's a challenge to our present. And how about it if we make sure that 20 years from now, when there is another genocide, we don't know exactly where it's going to be or when or how, that we can call upon 200,000 people that have been through the doors of this place and know that they will know how to respond because we've given them the tools to do so. So we did that, and we created the world's first genocide prevention organization called Aegis. It's based in London, and we, based, we, we linked together our true and, and really deeply felt understanding that we need to remember the past with a mission to ensure that we engage in the present, because I never wanted to sit on the sofa again and watch genocide unfold with no response. Because, you see, it's very easy when we do our historical um, analysis. We can look back over. Um, I can sit with the benefit of hindsight in 2012 and talk about the foreign policy, the British foreign policy in the 1930s or the refugee policy or whatever and say, well, they should have done this and they could have done that and they might have done that. And you know what? That's relatively easy to do with the benefit of hindsight. But the question is, when history is unfolding, where are you? It's very much more challenging to know, to be able to filter, to work out what it is your responsibility is in relationship to everything else. What matters to me and why are the people that became my mentors. Victoria. Victoria, who I knew for 11 months, just 11 months, but probably was my closest friend ever. 
called me a few days, a few weeks before the Holocaust Center opened. Can I come to the opening? I said, look, I would really love you to, but we, we've already had our RSVPs and it, we're full. She said, but, okay, um, the thing is, I'm a survivor of Auschwitz. I live a few miles away. I've never told anybody my story, um, but I think I should be, I really want to be there for you. So I did something remarkably British on, the, on reflection. I said, look, put the kettle on, make a pot of tea, I'll be there in half an hour. Half an hour later, I was sitting in her front room. She was sitting in her wheelchair, handicapped from the torture that she had in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And we talked, and she told me her story. A story she'd only ever told to her psychiatrist and to her husband, not even to her son. About um, three or four months later, she and I were going out regularly to schools by this time. She got the courage to go and talk and tell her story. And so we'd spent a lot of time together. And I noticed that um, she always cried at the same point in her story when she was telling her personal experience of being in, in the Holocaust. So I said to her one day, Victoria, um, tell me, why do you always cry at the same point? And she said, well, you know, um, I'd been in Milan in the resistance. I'd been in Fossoli, the detention center, the in uh, Italy, five days on the train, arrived at Auschwitz, and, and she described all of the experiences of uh, beatings and, and dysentery and typhus and seeing people being, the trains coming in and people being dispatched to their deaths. Uh, very profound story, uh, she told. And then she always cried at the point just near the end of her story when they were about to leave Auschwitz. It just seemed like the wrong moment somehow. So she said, well, it was very simple. We were standing in, a, in the counting square, the Appellplatz, as they called it, and there was five of us. And she says, as you know from my story, I'd found my sister, Olga. The two of them had been separated in Milan, as happened in these situations. They turn up in the same barracks in Auschwitz a year later. I needed Olga to survive. We, we helped each other a great deal. But in the same row of five girls was another sister. They were standing in this accounting square watching two girls being hanged. The reason they were being hanged was that they had brought explosives into Auschwitz that had blown up one of the gas chambers in October 1944. They'd been caught. Summary execution was taking place. The sister of one of the girls being hanged was standing next to, the, next to her sister. She said, the other thing was that I'm standing there and I've got these thick rim glasses. And uh, she said, as you know, I can't see without them. So by this time, she said, I still have the same eyesight problem, and um, my glasses are hanging on with a piece of string around my head. And I know there's a lot of pushing and shoving for food, for the latrine. One of these days, my glasses are going to end up in the mud, and I'm not going to find my way to the work commando or to the barracks. I'm going to be dead by nightfall. I was starving. I was weak. I was really finished. And what was going through my mind was, look, change places with the girl, just offer to, I was standing on the front row, she said. I, all I had to do was step forward and say, take me. And I wanted to do it, I wanted to say, take me, because she's a hero, she can do something. She said, I couldn't put one foot in front of the other, because I just wanted to live another day. She said, the third thing was, the SS had, had a, put a Christmas tree up in the Appellplatz, right near where the gallows were. And the sense of anger, I just go, how dare you? She said, and those emotions come flooding back, guilt, frustration, anger. She said, it's just too much for me, I cry. I said, you wouldn't do me a favor, would you? Just go back to the beginning of your story and tell me, why do you tell the story at each episode that you tell? And I found out that she never told a life history. What she was talking about was she was telling her, uh, the history of her life for a lesson for life. It was about family and tenacity and resistance and hanging on and the people around you, who you can trust, who you can't trust, about God and belief and faith. And then I realized was, there's so much more to this that I never knew. And so those people became, those people, individuals, Eric, Victoria, Valdemar, Ibi, became my mentors. All of them now, gone. So wind forward now 2002, and I'm in Kigali, Rwanda. I'm not surrounded by people who are 75 years old, 30 years my senior, maybe 40 years my senior. 
telling me from the benefit of old age and the wisdom of life about what these things mean. Now I'm in an office and I'm surrounded by 25 young people who are 15 years my junior, all of them the survivors of genocide. And this time, even though I'm running that office and this time building a museum in Kigali, Rwanda, to, de to, the, to create the National Genocide Museum in Rwanda, the people I'm working with now are my juniors. And I was one of those that let them down. So two short stories to end of what matters to me and why. Eve was in, in the next office to me, computer guy. Tap, 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 tap all day. He was very noisy on the keyboard, clunkety clunk, clap, clap, tap. Um, I knew he was a survivor of the genocide, but we didn't talk about that in the office. You know, we weren't there for therapy. We weren't there for, for storytelling. We were working. We were doing a project. So it wasn't that kind of context. But so happened one day we were doing a project to document where the mass killings had taken place around Kigali. 890 sites of mass killing we found around the city, just the one city. We wanted to document that because we knew the topography was going to change. The people were going to put freeways through and build hotels and government buildings and businesses. And one day we're going to come back and, you know, 10 people are going to be, have been murdered here, but the freeway's gone right through the middle of it. So we wanted to be able to say what happened, where, and when, to whom, and how. A market using GIS technology. You know, you get your little, little thing and you go to the spot and you interview the person and you go bleep and you capture the spot, and you've captured the testimony, you've got the photographs, you've got the artifacts, and you've got a, 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 a geographic um, representation of what occurred. So we're doing this project and one day we needed to go and test the technology. So Eve, the computer guy, goes, oh, I, I know where we can go. We get in the Jeep, we drive out of the town, down a little lane, into a very nice suburb. And being the naive kind of individual that I am, I said, oh, this is a nice little suburb. It must have been all built since the genocide seven years ago. He said, no, well, it's always been here. Didn't say anything more than that. We come to the last house. On the other side of it, they see there's fields and there's palm trees. He stops, gets out of the Jeep, takes the keys, and goes up to a brick wall. And in the brick wall, there's a, there's a wooden door. And he opens the door and walks through. And on the other side of this door, there's a beautiful bungalow with a veranda and a nicely cut lawn with pink azaleas around the edges of it. Very nice. He walks to the middle of the lawn, takes out his little bleeper and goes, bleep. Here. I said, what's here? He said, well, there's a mass grave here. I said, there is? Who's buried here? He said, well, my mom and my dad and my sister and my cousin and the lady from across the road. She was lying in the street, so I thought I'd better bury her too. I'm looking at a 21-year-old man seven years after the genocide. I said, Eve, how old were you? He said, I was 13. I said, who lives here now? He said, I do. Two days later, I was sitting on the same veranda interviewing him for the, for the documentary in the museum, and he told me about his life in suburbia. See, in, somewhere in the back of my mind, I had it in my mind, you know, um, Rwanda, if genocide is going to take place, it's going to be in a place you know, where there's failure in all sorts of ways, economic and, and, and otherwise, uh, and a history of conflict, and, you know, if it's going to happen somewhere, it's going to be a place like that. I would never have expressed that. I didn't have that view, but that must have been there somehow because it changed through that interview because he described his life in suburbia and how they would go to school and what they would do with the soccer and how his parents would work with the neighbors next door and sometimes the moms would pick them up and they, they, they describe what I do with my kids and the, the, the fact that dad, dads would sit on the veranda and have a beer together and so on and uh, how the evening would go. We got to the point about the genocide, and they said, who killed your family? And he said, well, the guy next door. I said, not the same fellow who sat on the veranda, well, actually, the very chairs we were sitting in, um, and having a beer with your father in the evening. He said, yeah, same guy. Threw his uh, sister down the well alive. So I came away from Rwanda two years later, knowing that not if it could happen anywhere, it was likely to be there, but if it happened there, it could happen anywhere. But in the same way that we heard the stories of heroism um, around uh, Armin T. Wegner and what he did countless times to warn us about genocide, I end with a, one other story because in all of these situations of darkness and 
terrible, um, troubling and horrific stories in which you could lose all trust in humanity, there always seems to be some people that defy that. And that's what matters to me, and this is why. Beata was 14 years old. She'd survived the day the genocide began. She was supposed to have gone home to her mother, but as happens with 14-year-olds, they'd had an argument. She decided to stay with her uncle. She didn't know the genocide was about to start and that her mother would be one of those bodies that floated down the river that I saw on my TV a few days later. She was just being a teenager, so she stayed with her uncle and her cousins, and of course the genocide started, and she was in the house, and the killers came in the front door. She was the only one that made it out of the house and over the back wall into the alley at the back. So she ran. She ran to another region where people wouldn't know her. She found an old woman, also a Tutsi, um, who had a little bedsit in a little courtyard. It was very obscure, so nobody really knew she was there. And this woman said, you can come in and stay with me, but here's the deal. I'm staying in the bedsit. I'm staying in the house. You're going to go out and find food. Otherwise, stay. So every day she would go out, and she would be the one foraging for food. One day she was out in the streets, and one of her school friends saw her and screamed at the top of her voice, there's a snake in the street. And before she knew it, she was running down the street with a killer right behind her. She ran into the courtyard and banged on the door of the bedsit. The woman lived in a 10 by 10 foot room. It would have taken her three or four seconds to get to the door and unlock it and open it, but the door didn't open. And she was trapped in the courtyard. She scrambled over the wood and the barrels and all the things that were in the courtyard with the killer not far behind her. The only way, only thing she had going for her was there was a blind alley at the back of the courtyard with a locked gate at the end of it. Maybe she could get over the gate before he got there. She ran down the blind alley. He was right behind her. She couldn't scramble over the gate. She banged on the gate, screaming, and to her surprise, the bolt on the gate unlocked. She fell through. The bolt went back, and on the other side of the gate was an 11-year-old. Aisha. The two of them ran across the yard and into the house screaming and went under the bed. The killer, who was bigger, obviously taller than she was, managed to scramble over the gate, came down the other side and ran across the yard screaming for her. The owner of the house came out and stood in the doorway, Yahya. Yahya stands there with his arms folded, the guy with a machete standing right in front of him. And he's screaming, give me the girl, I know she came in here. Yahya called the two girls out from the house, from under the beds, and he brought them to the door, and he stood holding his 11-year-old daughter and the hand of a 14-year-old that he'd never met in his life, and he said to the killer, you kill my daughter before you kill this girl. Now get off my site, um, off my home right now, otherwise the wrath of Allah will be upon you forever. So I was sitting with Yahya on the same doorstep, asking him the question, so why did you do that? He said, well, it says in the Quran that if you save one life, it's as if you save the whole world. And if you destroy one life, it's as if you destroy the whole world. So I asked him if he knew if the same um, text was in the, in the Jewish tradition, in the Talmud. He'd never heard of the Talmud. He was very interested to hear about it, particularly because it had something from the Quran in it. And he said, you know, it's just a principle that life is sacred. And if I make a decision between my daughter's life and the other life, who am I to decide? I just gave the guy the chance and told him to leave. Yahya saved 30 people in his house by the end of the genocide. Why does that matter to me? Well, the girl he saved um, married my brother. And so every time I take my seven-year-old niece, Ariella Aisha, and pick her up from school, or we celebrate a birthday, or we have some time together as a family, um, the actions of Yahya have very real meaning to our family, and therefore to me. Thank you. All right, we're on a time scale, and Varun's given me another four minutes. Any questions?
You have to ask a question, otherwise I'll start again and I'll be here another hour. Any questions? Yeah, just one here. Yeah. So the question is about USC Shoah Foundation. Um, here on campus, we have the largest collection of um, audiovisual testimony on a single subject in the world. There are 52,000 survivors of, and witnesses of the Holocaust available. You, if you have a USC um, email address, um, you can get that. It, come to the USC Show Foundation and see it. You can see it in your dorm. You can see it in your school. Um, it's available to you. Um, you can get to it um, if you go to the Show Foundation website. So just Google Show Foundation, you'll find that there. And there are instructions for how to, how to get onto that. Um, if you don't have that, then come down to the Show Foundation. We have a great team that will show you how to use it. Uh, one thing I would say about the, the archive, since you're asking that question, is um, right now, um, and this does matter to me also, um, is that we are expanding the archive so that we currently have 52,000 testimonies that relate to the Holocaust period. Uh, we've, we've got our first 50 testimonies from Rwanda have just arrived on campus and we're doing those in batches of 50 um, so that we can tell the story of the Rwandan genocide. We have a collection of testimonies coming from Armenia um, that were taken actually um, from 1967 to 2000 um, and are part of the Armenian Film Foundation's collection. So those of you who do have an interest in the Holocaust, human rights and genocide studies, then please do come and see us because uh, it may relate to interests that you have either personally or of course uh, to do with your classes and we're delighted to see you there. Hi. Um, I thought this your talk was incredibly moving. You're a fabulous speaker. Thank you for sharing these things with us. But I wanted to ask, so in that moment when you decided I was going to get on a plane and get myself there and realize that there were things you could do that would be more effective. So if other people are sitting around looking at something horrible happening in the world and say, I wish there was something I can do about it, well, what is it that we who haven't dedicated our lives as you have? What is it that we can do in response to the things that we see? So first thing is, the, the, the lesson of Armin Wegner is this. He tried to prevent, well, he was in Armenia and saw the genocide unfolding in Armenia. What he did, he took photographs. You say, well, what, what's that going to do? You know, um, he didn't prevent the genocide from occurring, but what he did, he gave a human face and a human voice to what was occurred, and he used those photographs to fight for justice afterwards. He then failed to prevent the, uh, what he saw was going to unfold in the Soviet Union. He then failed to prevent the Holocaust. He was an absolute failure. But one thing about him was this. He absolutely knew the power of the individual. And the reason he ended up spending time in seven concentration camps is he wrote a letter. But when you see that letter today, five pages of beautiful prose in which he basically said to, the, to uh, Adolf Hitler, who's writing an open letter to what you did to the Jews of Germany today on the very first day of public persecution, you did to me as a German. And everybody open-minded and free-thinking like I am in a civilization like ours, we're going to rise up and we're going to stop you. And if you do not stop, not only will it lead to the destruction of, these, of this community, but it will bring shame upon our nation for all time and stop in our name. When you look at that, what you understand is that there could have been an entirely different course of action. Because if he could know that, then many other people could have. If he understood the consequences, then governments could have understood the consequences. So even even though he failed, right now in history, he holds everybody to account. So don't be afraid to use your voice. If nobody listens, it's not a failure. Because he never he failed to prevent it, but he didn't fail as an individual. Second thing to say is this: we're a very connected world. The refugees living in the uh, refugee camps in Chad that have fled from Darfur have something that we all have in our pockets. They have mobile phones. And when you tweet, they know the tweet feeds and what's going on in the Twitter feeds. And when you stop, they know you've lost interest. We, we have ears all over this globe. Now, what, why is that important? If you're sitting in a refugee camp in Chad, having had your, one of your family members killed and having seen your mother raped or whatever it might have been recently, if you think the world is listening and is with you, it means a great deal. It may not stop the geopolitical macro things from occurring. It may not instigate big change, but it matters to those who are going through it. And the reason the Show Foundation's archive is there and why it's important to us is it's about individual people 
because the genocide does not happen en masse. It occurs many times over simultaneously, but the people who are victims of it uh, are not experiencing it en masse. They're experiencing it individually, and they what just much of the time just want to know that we're really there for them. Hi. Uh, um, in your opinion, the UN, do you think that they can be an effective intervention in their current structure for genocide? Or do you think that a different national global organization needs to be formed to address these types of situations? So that They seem to be aware of these genocides that occurs, but there's so much political infighting that occurs that it goes on for months and months and months and people keep dying. Yeah. If we could disassemble uh, the United Nations and reassemble it, that would be tremendous. We'd probably end up with a very similar thing to what we have right now because it's, it's a result of the... Um, uh, whatever structural problems it has, it's a result of the... Of the um, indiv it's a result of the collective wills of the people, uh, the, the members of it. Um, actually, the UN is probably the best vehicle to use. It's, sometimes it's very... Um, uh, frustrating. It is very frustrating. I was involved in advocacy around the Darfur issue from 2003 uh, and was regularly involved in briefings that were going into the Security Council and seeing where they were on the agenda and they never got up the agenda and they were never addressed. Um, so um, it, it means that we have, to, we have to take, not have our expectations too high. Um, is there, w would there be value in uh, other coalitions or international organizations being formed to help with this? Yes, but I think it's better to use the structures that are, that are there um, and to use them more effectively. But that requires us um, to use the power that we have within our democracy to demand that of our elected um, representatives uh, and to make it known to them that's what we want to see happen. Um, and there are enough democracies of, uh, engaged and involved in um, the United Nations for that to occur to have some impact. So I think never underestimate the value of that. Second thing is though, of course, um, the Security Council having both China and Russia on, on as permanent members uh, makes it extremely difficult to, because of their, their interests, and particularly China's interest, for example, in Africa. Um, you know, spending quite a lot of time in Africa, I see just how invested the Chinese are in all sorts of ways. And um, it's always going to be a difficult obstacle moving the Security Council to do things that are going to uh, um, you know, be counter to their, to their geopolitical and economic interests. So um, we need to keep going with our advocacy organizations um, within, our, within our own democracies. Uh, we need to be, as a, as a genocide prevention agency, actually, we tended to focus entirely on the Security Council and often on the middle powers. Because around the table, while you've got the permanent members, the middle powers that, come, that rotate in and out of there, countries like Canada, for example, um, uh, have a tremendous amount of influence. And so um, th there's different ways to be able to, to um, manage our expectations around the, the failings of the UN. Um, that's all I can say at the moment. I, I, I wish I could say... I've got a great idea, let's reform it, and it'll all be better. I don't foresee that. I think we have to use what's there more effectively. This one gentleman there, yeah. On this very campus several years ago, I was in Davidson speaking personally with a high-ranking Turkish official who absolutely denied the Armenian genocide. I was so flabbergasted, I didn't know how to tell him that hundreds of thousands of people have documented this, and he walked away saying, it's never happened. What do you feel can be the result of resolving this issue within our lifetime? Would you throw up your hands, or what can be done? So the first thing is that genocide doesn't end when the killing stops. There's a cycle to it, and it's, there's a trajectory to it that goes way, way beyond the end of the violent phase. And as a part of that post-genocide environment, denial is always a part of it. Um, you know, the, the, we know how undeniable the, the, um, the experiences and the facts are of the Holocaust, and yet we, we know just how much denial there is around the Holocaust itself. Um, that... that plays out in all sorts of ways um, in virtually every genocidal situation that I know of. Um, 
in terms of the Armenian genocide, um, that's the, there's a deep historical and political reason for that denial, and that isn't going to change anytime soon in Turkey. The important thing is, I think, for those of us who are engaged in education to make sure that we are placing the facts in the public domain so that people can make up their own minds based on what they see and hear. The reason that we at USC have decided to take the Armenian um, survivor collection into the, into the collection is um, when you see those witnesses talking about what they saw and you hear the way in which they describe it and you look at their faces, you know for certain that what they are saying is absolutely true. Um, and um, it places another layer of information into the public domain. Um, I've spoken to many folks um, it, within the Turkish government, including the guy who, in the Turkish ministry, is responsible for, for, for what, he call, what he calls the um, historical review uh, of the facts uh, that occurred in 1915 to 18. Uh, I know him personally, and I know that the government's not going to change that anytime soon. So we find alternative strategies. Are we, I think we're about wrapping up. There's one last one here, yeah. Um, so thank you so much for speaking. <clears throat> I was really moved by um, and confused by the way that neighbors can turn against each other. And I'm wondering what you think enables that and if there's some way that we could possibly prevent that. So the project that the USC Shoah Foundation has going in Rwanda right now, um, and it's actually launching in 2013 with our Rwandan partners, is as follows. First thing is that um, the prevention of the kind of violence that we, we just, I described and that you're asking about can only be done by the people that are there. What happens in, let's just talk about Rwanda. What happened in Rwanda was not the responsibility of the international community. It was the responsibility of Rwandans because they were the ones that carried out the killings. Um, so um, it's not the responsibility of the USC community to go and say, this is what you've got to do to prevent genocide in future. But what we try to do is enable and this is how we're doing that with our colleagues there. We know that the people that took, carried out the killings in Rwanda were aged mainly between 18 and 30 in, two, in 1994. We're going into a situation now of instability in Rwanda where there's going to be a presidential election in about 2016 or 17, and there will be political change of some description. That will lead into a period of instability, and we know that 70% of violent societies re-perpetrate within a generation. Generation, time is up. So we're at the most critical phase right now. As we go through that political change um, and, and shift, things could either become more solid and more secure or they be, could, could start to fall apart. So the way we're doing this is this. The 18 to 30-year-olds of 10 years from now are currently 8 to 20, and most of them are in school. So the focus is on high school education, actually middle and high school education in which we're talking about values. We're talking about what we know from the Show Foundation's archive and the research that we've been doing here at USC is when there were examples of rescue taking place, in other words, when people did the opposite of the concern that you and I are sharing right now, several things happened. They always knew somebody on the other side. They had a personal relationship of some description, not necessarily the person they were rescuing, but somebody that they could relate to. There was a level of trust of some description, not life and death trust, but somebody you think you could call on. Thirdly was, you had to be asked. If those three things came together, amazing networks developed uh, that resisted the, the, and defied the Nazi intent to murder. And in fact, many people were rescued that way. Model that for today. You take young people who have the values. Hutus and Tutsis that can, have looked each other in the eye and shared something together. They become a part of a peace club, as an after-school club. Part of the peace club is you're responsible for the values of your society. But the important thing is there, in that peace club, you find people that you can trust and you can call on. So when the society starts to break down, instead of you becoming fearful about the other side, because fear plays a very big factor, instead of you being dictated to in terms of what your values are or should not, you have a way of actually looking critically at, at uh, newspapers and at the media because you've learned that in your club. And the third thing is you know how to call on people. And you know that from your peace club there are going to be 50 alumni, 100 alumni, and you know that across the country there's going to be 200,000 alumni. You know that you're not alone. And that's the model that we're actually working on in terms of prevention at a grassroots level. Uh, we'll never know if it works because if genocide doesn't occur there, we won't know that's been effective. Uh, but please, God, uh, those people will, uh, next time they're challenged, not become the next round of killers, but become those who say, no, these are not our values and we don't share them. 
Thank you. We're done. Please join me one more time in thanking Stephen Smith for his extraordinary talk. And I'll just follow up quickly on something he said, life is sacred. Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great Jewish theologian, said, just to be as holy, just to live as divine. On our campus, we saw this last week, the fragility of life, when we had gunshots in, um, near the campus center. And I would say to all of you, uh, not to take your life for granted, to um, embrace the moment that you have right now, to uh, bury all the sort of... Um, uh, animosities, to forgive people that you want to forgive but haven't yet forgiven, uh, to take care of each other and to take care of yourself, and also to join us next month when we welcome Nicholas Warner. So thank you.